This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. It's with great pleasure that I get to introduce your speaker today, Dr. Erica Ullman Sapphire, who's also my boss. And Erica's really the reason that I came to Scripps. When I showed up for um, the interview day here at Scripps, she gave a very passionate speech about science and the type of works that she does in her lab. And she threw up some wonderful pictures of her and her grad students in Africa and talked about these highly deadly viruses that she studies. And I had read The Hot Zone recently and was just really excited to uh, you know, get this opportunity to be in a lab that studies these highly deadly viruses. So these are very hard to work with because they're what are called BSL-4 pathogens. So you have to work with them in very, very difficult conditions where you're fully in these like body suits. Uh, and, and so you know, she's had to do a lot of clever workarounds to study these viruses. And, and then also to, to serve a need in, uh, for these deadly viruses that mostly affect poor third world countries in Africa. And, and she's really done some great work there uh, for global health in the world. So um, Erica's from a, a small town in Texas and she went to do her undergraduate work at Rice. And from there, she decided that she wanted to pursue a PhD and a career in science. And she, moved, she came to the Scripps Research Institute and actually did a PhD here at Scripps. And from there, uh, she worked for Dr. Ian Wilson and uh, did some uh, really seminal work in the HIV field and, uh, and antibodies, which are really important for fighting off HIV. And from there, Erica wanted to become what's called a PI. So she wanted to run her own lab, be in charge of deciding what research she does, how it's done, and doing the best job that she can. So Erica decided to then do a postdoctoral position here at Scripps and has never really left because as she says that uh, Scripps has everything that she needs and is one of the best places in, in the world really to do science. So now she's a full professor here at Scripps and has been the recipient of numerous awards, including one, uh, the Presidential Early Career Award for Science and, Tech and Engineering, uh, where she actually went to the White House and met President Obama, which was pretty exciting. <laughs> so with that, I'll let Erica tell you all about these deadly viruses and the work that's going on in our lab. Thanks. Hi, welcome to Scripps, and thanks for coming today. And thank you, Jessica, for that really kind introduction. I'm actually really honored that you introduced me. And Jessica and students like her are the reason why I've stayed at Scripps for 22 years now. So I'm 44 this year, so I've been at Scripps just about as long as anywhere in my entire life, which is sort of funny, because I always considered myself a Texan, but now I'm a San Diegan, I suppose, by law of averages. Um, working with Jessica and other students like her is, is the reason that I took this job, and the reason I love this job, this, the, it's a tremendous luxury to work with smart, motivated people that are all trying to discover something new that would make a difference in the world. It's, it's a real luxury that a lot of people don't get. Today I want to talk to you about um, the work that we do, and in particular our unique global collaboration we form to get it done. So our lab studies a lot of bad things. The one that's been in the news this year is Ebola virus. But another one that you might not have heard about that's actually a greater threat to you is Lassa virus. So Lassa also causes the same kind of symptoms. The patients look essentially the same with a hemorrhagic fever, 
But instead of being rare, it's common. There's 100,000 cases of Lassa virus every year in West Africa, and it's actually the hemorrhagic fever that gets on a plane and flies to the United States and Europe more often, every single year. But there's no movie made about it. So nobody's afraid of it. Now, unfortunately, and fortunately, there's so much loss of virus every single year in West Africa that you could actually build a permanent infrastructure to study it. So unlike Ebola that pops up here and burns out and pops up there and burns out most years, uh, Lhasa is common every single year, particularly in this site, a city called Kenema, Sierra Leone. This is six hours east of the coast. And to get there, you fly for 24 hours, you take a ferry boat with 1,000 people, uh, followed by a helicopter left over from the Cold War, and then you're picked up in an NIH-funded Land Rover. Um, our grant pays for permanent drivers and mechanics, and these people have to be both mechanics and drivers to get that job, because when that Land Rover breaks down three hours from anywhere, they have to get their toolkit out of the back and put it together. So the reason we go there is that there's so much Lhasa in that place every year that they actually built a permanent hospital ward to treat it. And so before 2014, this was the only hospital ward in the world dedicated to treating these kinds of viruses, these hemorrhagic fever viruses. And this is where a lot of medical virologists and Doctors Without Borders people cut their teeth. This is hollowed ground for virology. Now, this is now looking inside the ward, and this is one of the nurses. So the nurses are local people that were Lhasa survivors, and that's how they got their job. So they're immune to the virus that's making their patients sick. Unfortunately, they weren't immune to Ebola virus. And so when Ebola virus broke out the same year, we lost an awful lot of our colleagues and the only doctor around that was treating them. For example, Mambu didn't make it through the outbreak. And so that was heartbreaking, because there aren't extra people with advanced medical training in Sierra Leone. But this was a year before the outbreak. And here you're looking into the loss award. And this was a little girl that was going to get better. So she's four years old. And outside the loss award, there is uh, this room here. So you can see kind of how basic the medical conditions are. But so if the patient's feeling a little better, they can go to this room, which is essentially outside. And then there's a screen here. And the other side of the screen, their family members can sit. So she wanted to see her mom and her aunts. And she was feeling a little better, and she wanted to eat. And she wanted something that her mom cooked her. And so her mom went to the market and bought some vegetables and sort of cooked some stew for her on the grounds of the hotel. And so she was going to get better. But the thing about viruses like this is that sometimes there's a treatment. So when I say you can treat loss if you catch it early enough, the treatment is an off-label use of a molecule called ribavirin. It's not specific. It has a lot of side effects. It's not very good. It's all there is. It's only somewhat effective very early in infection. The trouble is that very early in infection, the symptoms are a fever and a headache. Well, all of us have had a fever and a headache this year, right? How would you know that early in disease if what you had was loss of virus or something more mundane like the flu or anything else that circulates in that area? And the answer is that you really need a good diagnostic. Now, here's the trouble. There's no electricity there, or there's only electricity on Monday and Wednesday and only in the rainy season. The per capita income is $80 a year. So if your diagnostic costs $100, forget it. If your diagnostic requires electricity, like you have to plug a machine into a wall, forget it. And you need the results immediately. So if it takes you three days to drive the sample to the city where there is electricity, run the sample, get the answer, and come back, well, that patient might have progressed out of the treatment window. And sometimes you'll never find that patient again. And then what are you going to do with the patient in the meantime? This is particularly important in the, this year's Ebola outbreak. Because if somebody presents with symptoms like fever and a headache that look like anything, what, and, and you suspect it might be Ebola, but you don't know if it's Ebola or if it's the flu, what are you going to do with them for three days? You're not going to put them in the Ebola ward, because guess what? They're going to have Ebola if they didn't come in with it. And so what are you going to do? And so you need a diagnostic that's going to cost nothing, require no electricity, and work immediately. And so this is what we did. Attached to that loss award, and that's the reason why we go there, the scientists, is a laboratory. It's a biosafety level three laboratory. Now, loss is a biosafety level four virus, but three is about the best that 
could be built there. Tulane University built this. And it's a wonderful collaborative site for scientists of all fields to come there and study Lhasa and understand how to defeat it. Working in that ward, we developed with a company that's pretty good at this, these little dipstick tests for Lhasa. And then we could rapidly develop them into ones for Ebola. So it works just like a pregnancy test where it costs a buck or a couple of bucks. Um, it doesn't require electricity. You don't have to read to be able to run it. It's a drop of blood. And in five minutes, if there's two red lines, it's Lhasa or Ebola, whatever you're looking for. One red line, it's something else. And so you can figure out what the person exactly has while they're sitting there. Now, we, as I'm going to tell you next, are molecular biologists. So what we study in our lab are molecules, proteins particularly. And we make a lot of them. And so one of our jobs is to make buckets and buckets of the molecules of one of these viruses in a very safe, recombinant way for cheap. And so we're able to use those molecules to paint them onto these little dipstick assays and generate boxes and boxes of, of, of these diagnostics and actually ship them to Sierra Leone in the middle of the outbreak. They got emergency approval from the FDA. And then a study later from some of the medical organizations said that this outbreak would have been 30% smaller, meaning another 10,000 people would have not been infected had this been available at the start. But of course, this is research in progress, and it takes some time. And of course, you know, we had it for Lhasa, but it hadn't been approved, so we had to move fast. Now, that lab I just showed you was where the first case of Ebola virus was diagnosed in Sierra Leone in 2014. So, it was actually a surprise to everybody for Ebola virus to appear in West Africa. Now, where was it before? Ebola was discovered in 1976, so y'all weren't even born yet. And it was discovered in simultaneous outbreaks in the country called Zaire at the time and Sudan. Only later they figured out that it's two different viruses, the Zaire Ebola virus and the Sudan virus, but the, the symptoms looked the same. And so that's when they first discovered it, and those killed about 300 people each, or infected 300 people each. It went silent for three years and then popped up again in Sudan. And then it was silent for the next 14 years. We never saw Ebola virus again until it moved toward the coast with outbreaks in Gabon and then a single case in a veterinarian looking, trying to figure out why chimpanzees were dying in the forest in Ivory Coast. 1995, there was a bigger outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. 1996, another one in Gabon. And then 2000, what had been the biggest one until this year in Uganda, infecting 425 people. And then from 2000 on, those outbreaks became a lot more frequent. So there's some change in the ecological event. Two simultaneous outbreaks in, in 2001 in two different countries. Again in 2002, 2003, 2004, bigger ones in 2007. And actually in 2007, scientists discovered a whole new species. This is called the Bundabujo virus. It's a, it's, in the family of Ebola viruses that emerged that no one had ever seen before. And that came back in 2012. So another outbreak in 2008, another one in 2011. So you can see there's been an Ebola outbreak almost every year, two in 2012, and then in West Africa. So the size of these is for scale. The West African outbreak was the largest ever seen, ultimately over 28,000 people. And the kind of miraculous thing was is that it started with one infected kid, a two-year-old that had been playing in a hollowed out tree where they said that there were bats. Bats are thought to be the reservoir, but it's yet to be proven because it's hard to find Ebola virus in any of these bats. So from one infected kid, the virus ultimately spread to nearly 30,000 people. And that shows you how fast a virus can move. Consider also HIV. You know, HIV emerged um, in Africa, and you know, at one point in time, there were two or three people infected with HIV in the world, and now there's millions and millions. So viruses travel around the world, and they move fast. Now here's the map of Africa with the location of every Ebola virus outbreak we've seen. The color is different species of the virus. So there's four different Ebola viruses, and your antibodies react to them differently. So you might need different treatments, or if we're lucky, and what we're trying to do is to get one treatment that could address them all. So the one point I want to make is that viruses emerge and reemerge. There's always a new virus. There's a SARS. There's a MERS. A MERS. And then viruses reemerge. You know, Ebola was silent, and then it came back. The outbreaks are happening at greater and greater frequency. We had Zika this year, 
It was discovered in 1947, but nobody ever thought it was much of a problem because most people infected don't even know. They don't have any symptoms. It's only when it grew to a very large number in Brazil and they started seeing it linked to birth defects and Guillain-Barre syndrome. But as we move into the forest and as climate changes, we can expect more and more of these outbreaks of viruses. The second thing is that viruses travel. Just because it's somebody else's problem right now doesn't mean it's not gonna be your problem tomorrow. And more importantly, we can't be defenseless. We need treatments and vaccines against them. And we need them fast. You can't start a 10-year research project in the middle of an Ebola virus outbreak and hope to have results that are gonna help anybody now. They might help somebody in the future. But we need to figure out how to do this work faster. So if you want fast progress, in my experience, you need two things. You need a really good team. And this team has to be people with lots of different expertise. They could each bring a different tool to bear. And you need a roadmap. You need a good plan. Now, the roadmap is often the structure of the virus itself, or the key molecule you're trying to target in the virus. So if you want to know how to get to SeaWorld, what do you do? You consult a map. And you get a much better idea if you can look at a more and more detailed maps, like a, a satellite map, where you can have an idea of what it's going to look like when you get there, and what the highs and lows are, and the canyons and the valleys. And so what we do here is to generate those roadmaps toward a therapy by solving the structures of a protein. So I'll show you what that means. Now, when you think about protein, you probably think about something like this, right? OK. Well, just like snow is made of snowflakes, and every snowflake has its own particular structure, often symmetric, protein, meaning a chicken breast, a steak, a block of tofu, is made of individual protein molecules. And each one of those individual protein molecules, like snowflakes, has its own particular structure. And many of them have some really beautiful symmetry. This is how the amino acids that build up a protein fold. And when they knit into a particular structure, that determines how it operates in biology. So by solving the structures of these things, we can say, ah, the important site might be in the center. And this is where we need to find chemists that can design a good drug that's going to bind in there. So what are the proteins of Ebola virus? Well, this is the picture you saw on TV this year. Ebola is a long filamentous virus. This is the first picture ever taken of it in 1976. And in fact, the CDC microscopist didn't even know it was anything particularly bad, and he wasn't wearing gloves when he did the study. But he was OK. So it's, it's like a strand of spaghetti. It'll adopt whatever shape you throw it against the wall, and it sticks in. So the wall here is the little grid used for electron microscopy. They can be straight. They can be curved. They can adopt this characteristic not seen for the first time in 1976. Now, on the surface of the virus, dot, 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 there's a lawn of little proteins that we call GP. Let's say it's for glycoprotein. Glyco means sugar. And so this is a sugar-coated protein, a little bit like cotton candy, and it lines the surface. And that's the only thing the virus has to attach to your cells and drive itself in. So that's a pretty good target for trying to figure out how to fight the virus. Now, in a five-year effort in my lab, and this is the first project I did when I was a, you know, a brand new, shiny assistant professor, and I'd kind of staked my whole career in getting this one thing done, this was the, pro the st structure that we solved. And this is the molecule that's on the surface of Ebola virus. So you can see blue and green and white, and it, so you see it's shaped like a bowl. The blue and green parts are what attaches to your cell. And then the white parts that wrap around the bottom are what drives the virus into your cell. And so the white part is the protein machinery, and it's like a thread of the, the amino acids, the polypeptides, wrapped around the outside of this bowl. In infection, it will unwrap, drive itself into your cell, actually penetrate the membrane, and then collapse from a piece of protein anchored to the viral membrane up to bind it. And as it collapses and changes structure, it'll force the virus's membrane into your cellular membrane. That collapses. It rips open a hole in the center. And then the virus's genetic material get into your cell. So this is the piece of machinery that does that. Now, on the upper and outer parts, so first let me show you the blue and green is the structure we saw. So that's the molecular surface. And the upper and outer parts are something else. We call it a mucin-like domain. So just like the mucus in your nose, it's kind of sticky and it's full of carbohydrates. The mucin-like domain is pretty flexible and disordered. 
and we couldn't visualize it at high resolution, but we know it's attached there. Now, I've been talking about carbohydrate, and when you think about carbohydrate, you're probably thinking about something like this. <laughs> and when you think about, and this is made from long-chain sugars, like in your whole grains you're supposed to eat, and short-chain sugars in the Twinkies you're not supposed to eat. And when you think about a protein wrapped in carbohydrate, you're probably thinking about something like that. But, <laughs> yeah, like a corn dog. This is our protein wrapped in carbohydrate. So here's the protein in this knit together symmetric series of strands, and this is our carbohydrate. It's a disordered cloud of sugar that coats this molecule, like cotton candy around the cone in the center. And that sugar makes this protein a wolf in sheep's clothing. Because as the virus is produced in human cells, and that sugar-coated protein emerges from them, it's coated in human sugars. So if your immune system is floating around, the molecules immune system, and they're looking for something foreign that's a pathogen to attack, all they see is a cloud of human sugars. And they say, there's nothing to see here, move right along. So this is how the virus hides itself from immune surveillance. It hides itself from your body's ability to detect that there's something foreign and bad infected. Okay, now here's how it's pretty smart. The way the virus gets in is that the cell kind of swallows it whole. It's a process called macropenocytosis. Once that virus is inside your cell, in a compartment called the endosome, it hijacks human enzymes. And the job of those human enzymes is to cleave protein, to cut it up. And what it does is it cleaves the strand that anchors all that sugar on. So it essentially, the, it hijacks your human machinery to remove its cloak. So this is what it looks like on the surface of the virus. And then once it's inside your shell, it sheds all that carbohydrate, leaving behind this little core. And that core is what actually does the job of attaching to your cell and then driving it in and ripping the membrane and shoving its, its genetic material inside your cell. So as it gets in, it sheds its protective cloak. It also means that there's two really different versions of this protein in infection. One version is what your immune system is searching at. And so that's the part that has to be exposed for antibody surveillance. But then there's a whole other version of this protein. It's what actually does the job of infecting your cells. And so you want to think about that one for drugs that could block that process. So because this protein, which is your main target of antibodies in your immune system and a vaccine that would elicit them, exists in such different structures, well, what does that mean? Well, it means that it's pretty com complicated. You can have a lot of target sites that are just plain lost. So we know you can develop a lot of antibodies against pieces of protein in between the sugars over here, but the virus doesn't care. Even if it's completely anchored by all those immune system antibodies, once it's gotten inside the cell, it just drops the cloak, drops the antibodies, leaving behind its important payload. And then what you might really want to hit, which is the surface of this, particularly right here, this is the spot that it uses to anchor to the molecule it needs to start that process of infecting the cell. And that spot is exactly the same across Ebola virus, Sudan virus, Mendebujo virus, Marburg virus, and all the viruses like that. So that's a really good spot you could use to nail all of those viruses, but it's hard because this only gets shown once it's inside your cell away from immune detection. It's hidden. It's underneath all this stuff on the surface of the virus. Okay, so what works? The term you use in virology is neutralization, what neutralizes the virus or neutralizes the threat. This is the first antibody ever shown to neutralize Ebola virus, and this was done way back in 1995. This is an antibody discovered at Scripps by my postdoc mentor, Dennis Burton. And he actually found it in a person that had survived the 1995 outbreak in Kikwit Zaire. Now this antibody, and what we're showing you here, is the molecular structure of the antibody, which is in yellow, anchored on to that Ebola glycoprotein in blue and white. So the antibody's been smart. It's bypassed all that changing carbohydrate-covered stuff at the top, and instead it's anchored itself to the bottom. It binds mostly to white and a little bit of blue. It ties the two together. And more importantly, remember what I said, that that white stuff was machinery that started life like this, and then in infection it unwrapped and drove itself into the membrane that started the infection process? What this antibody does is it 
anchors it in place. It actually locks the structure together so that it cannot unwrap and it cannot infect the structure. It just mechanically inactivates that machinery, and that's how it neutralizes the virus. But here's the funny thing. That antibody looked brilliant in test tubes. It was the most potent thing we'd ever seen against Ebola virus. It saved all of the mice from a lethal dose of virus. It saved all of the guinea pigs from a lethal dose of Ebola virus. But the primates all died. So why didn't it work? Now, at the time, that was the best antibody <coughs> known against Ebola virus anywhere in the world. And so the field of scientists thought, well, geez, the best we have wasn't good enough. Does that mean that antibodies in general aren't effective against this virus? This virus is too lethal. It's too fast. Maybe antibodies can't cope. But it turns out that four years later, four groups of scientists all independently and at the same, sort of the same time found that although that one antibody by itself wasn't effective in primates, mixtures of antibodies could cure infection, even after the animals were really sick. Now, when you think about a cocktail, this is probably what you're thinking about. But when we think about a cocktail, this is what we're thinking about, an antibody mixture. So when we say a cocktail, we mean that a precise formulation of a couple of different antibodies all together, that together have a combination synergistic one-two punch effect. OK. So what are these Ebola-curing cocktails that were found? Well, this is the first one we looked at. This is the one that was developed at the Army, and specifically at USAMRID. It's three antibodies. We're looking at structures. This is what they're named. But here's the unexpected thing. They bind mucin, mucin, and the sugar cat. They bind the pieces of the protein that had all that sugar attached to them. They bind the pieces of the protein that get cut off in infection. And here's the other funny thing. By themselves, and even together, these antibodies don't neutralize the virus well at all in test tubes. And so if you're trying to use test tube-like lab assays to figure out what was going to work, you never would have picked these. Now, fortunately, the Army was more interested in what would cure animals than what would cure test tubes. And so they put them together, and they found that it worked. So even though they didn't work in test tubes, they did work in saving the lives of non-human primates, so macaques. So what's that? We were confused, too. We had this antibody at the top, which works brilliantly in test tubes, but not in the animals. We had this combination that saved the lives of the animals, but you would never have figured that out from looking in test tubes. So did that mean that this was wrong, and binding the changing top part was right in some way that we didn't understand? Or did that mean that the yellow thing was delivered all by itself, whereas this thing, this cocktail, was three antibodies all together? Now, the results we had at the time suggested, well, maybe that was it. Maybe you need a mixture. <laughs> One antibody by itself didn't work. When you put two antibodies together, you save some of the monkeys. When the Army put their three together, they saved all the monkeys. When Canada put their three together, they saved all their monkeys. So do you just need three? Now, don't roll that one at the top out yet. But here's what we thought. If we just need a mixture, how are we going to find that mixture? And how are we going to formulate it? So the first thing is, how many antibodies should go into that mixture? Is that magic number three? Or if we found two that were strong enough, would that work? Or would four be better? And here's the most important question. How are we going to figure out which ones are best? What are you going to do? You can't start in non-human primates. Nobody wants to work in primates. We'd like to figure things out using test tubes. We want to figure it out in plastic assays in the lab that are cheap and easy and require no animals. But the stuff we did in the lab wasn't predicting what would ultimately protect living things. So how are we going to figure out what works? And if the data so far is telling us that you have to have a mixture or a cocktail, you want three antibodies that are going to work well together, and not ones that are going to compete with each other. So how are we going to figure that out? Well, it's a pretty complex problem, and there's nested sets of questions in there. And what we thought at the time, this is now 2012, this is two years pre-outbreak, we need a significant sample size. What I've shown you so far was structures of four antibodies. The Army had three, the Canada had three. Maybe we hadn't looked at enough samples to really figure out or determine the rules for what was going to work. Maybe we just needed to do this on a bigger scale. 
And this is what we formed, the Viral Hemorrhagic Fever Immunotherapeutic Consortium. It's a mouthful. We call it the VIC, V-I-C. Now, this is a global collaboration, and I think something on this scale has never happened before. We're now up to 40 labs on four different continents. Academic labs like professors and graduate students and for-profit pharmaceutical companies that are all working together with a common goal of figuring out what antibodies work and why and how we could predict what would ultimately work in animals cheaply and quickly using test tubes. Once we figure out these therapies, we would like to be able to donate them to the people that need them. And also these are going to be really good, what we call the benchmark, so a, a, a measurement for or against which better things that could be developed in the future can be compared. Now we thought we'd go about this two different ways, kind of a tortoise and hare strategy. The tortoise strategy is to just do it properly, get all the antibodies we can from across the world, we're up to 176, and we're going to blind them, So what would that, or blind the investigators to what the antibodies are. So what that means is all the antibodies come in, and as soon as they come into my lab, they're given a code name. Now, two techs in my lab know what all the code names are. They're not allowed to ride in the same car. They can't eat the same mayonnaise at the picnic. But those code names are secret, so that none of, of anybody else doing the study knows whose antibodies are whose. This makes it a very fair study. We're just going to look at the data to say what's best without anybody being, trying to be able to argue for advancing their own antibodies in the study. And we're going to do all kinds of different things. We're going to solve molecular structures. We're going to look at all the different laboratory assays. We're going to put them into animals to try to figure out what is best and how it could be predicted. Now, a study in that kind of scale is going to take a few years. Now, we set this up in 2012. This is two years pre-outbreak. And two of the professors in the collaboration, Larry Zeitlin and Gary Kominger, said, well, this is a great idea. This is going to take a while. What if we need something faster? What if there's an outbreak? And that actually happened. And so in anticipation that there might be an outbreak, we devised the hair strategy of this. And the hair strategy was to take only six antibodies. Instead of everything available around the world, just six. The three from the army that worked and the three from Canada that worked. And what they were going to do is just mix and match those six. And the only studies we were going to do was to solve structures and to figure out what worked in primates. From that little study, which is kind of a proof of concept for the big one, they're able to develop ZMAP. And ZMAP was the antibody therapy that was used compassionately, beginning with American missionaries and then ultimately 27 different people in the outbreak, 25 of whom lived. So it's pretty cool that we could do this that fast. So ZMAP was discovered February 2014. That's when they showed that it would work in animals. But patient zero, the person who started the outbreak, the two-year-old in Guinea, was infected December 13, 2013. And so from December to February, those cases were doubling every three weeks. And so a therapy that looked better than anything we'd ever seen before that would cure really, really sick primates from a Ebola infection was discovered in the middle of the outbreak. And so it's pretty exciting that it was able to be delivered that fast. And of course, then they were immediately trying to figure out how to scale up and make more. OK, so what is this thing? This is the structure of ZMAP. This is from my Scripps colleague, Andrew Ward's lab, solved by a Scripps graduate student, Daniel Murin. So what this microscope image shows, so here's the glycoprotein. I've previously shown it to you in blue and white. This is a different resolution, We're coloring it all gray. And there's three different antibodies anchored to it, green, blue, and yellow. The blue one is called 13C6. That came from the Army. It's one of those ones that really doesn't have any appreciable effect in test tubes. Instead, we think that its job is probably to recruit the, mi or the right immune system function. And that's the difference between a test tube and an animal, right? An animal has an immune system, a test tube doesn't. Now, these two at the bottom came from Canada, the green and yellow ones. And they do work in those test tube assays. They do neutralize the virus. And they were picked for the Canadian cocktail based <laughs> upon their ability to perform that function in those test tubes. And so the important thing here is that different labs went about this different ways. Different labs had different ideas about how they were going to pick their samples and different approaches to try to cure a bowl of virus infection. And it turned out it was the combination of the two strategies that gave us better than any individual one before. So these two antibodies do neutralize, and they look exactly like that yellow antibody I showed you before, the KZ52. They mine exactly the same spot. So what we learned from ZMAP is that neutralization, that ability to mechanically block the virus's infection in test tubes, is important. It's really important. 
but you got to have more. You have to have something which is a signal beacon to recruit the immune system to say, this is something that needs to be destroyed. Okay, so not so much that binding the bottom was wrong and binding the top was right, but that this is pretty good for fighting Ebola virus, but you also need this one. And then maybe now we can throw those out. We've shown they're not as good. Okay, now, I've drawn the structure this way. So remember that, that a glycoprotein had, was a three-part molecule. There are three different shades of blue. There's, you know, one, two, three in the structure we're showing here. And I've drawn it with a yellow one bound onto a copy A and the green one bound onto copy B. But I can also draw it another way. Because the yellow and green bind exactly the same place and they can't bind at the same time. What I'm drawing you here would never happen in biology. Only one could bind. They would push the other off, whichever one, maybe, maybe whichever one got there first. But what that tells us is that maybe these antibodies are doing the same thing. Maybe they're effectively the same. Now we know that one of them is a whole lot more effective than the other, and you can also make a whole lot more of it. So maybe a good way to improve ZMAP and make it available to more people is to throw out the one that's hard to produce and put in more of the other. Or throw out the one that doesn't work as well and is hard to produce, instead come up with another antibody against some other site that could inactivate the virus a different way, and maybe that would prevent mutagenic escape. And so some of the work that the consortium is doing now is trying to figure out if these are effectively the same or if they're different, and we can really throw one out. Okay, now here's the important question. If we want to throw one out and put something else in, what else is there? And that comes from the tortoise strategy. This is the big global collaboration. What are we going to find? Okay, the blue and white structure I showed you before, I'm now color showing you in a ribbon, and I'm coloring it differently. I'm coloring it by its component parts. It's got a part up here, the sugar-coated part we call the mucin. This thing's called the glycan cap. We call the green part the core. The base, where KZ52 and 2 thirds of ZMAP bind, I'm coloring red. And then the fusion loop, that piece of machinery that wraps around the outside, I'm coloring it pink. So the first thing we did was we got all the antibodies in the world into the lab, and we figured out where they bind. We could sort them into their groups. So for example, we found 23 against the glycan cap, 18 against the mucin, eight against the base. So in this study somewhere, these are all their code names, is KZ52 and the two from ZMAP and others from around the world that do the same thing and bind the same place. Okay, so we figured out where they all anchor onto the glycoprotein. Now we're gonna try to figure out what works. Now to try to figure out which laboratory test is most predictive of function in a living thing, we're doing lots of different laboratory tests, and we're doing them at biosafety level two, biosafety level three, and biosafety level four, using actual Ebola virus, using lots of different models. We're comparing all the results. What we can figure out so far is you, you can roughly bin the antibodies into those that are very strong against Ebola virus, potent, those that have only a moderate activity, and those are weak. Now, all the antibodies are given the code name. The code name is called VIC something or other, VIC80, VIC101. So we figure out those that work really well in test tubes, those that work a little bit, and then there's a lot that don't work at all. You can color code them by epitope. Epitope means the place on Ebola virus they bind. And then you can slot them back in the grid. So here are all the antibodies in the study. Here's their code name. And then if it has a white letter, that means it neutralizes strongly for S, weakly for W. Okay, so we can figure out what works in test tubes. Okay, the important thing is what's gonna work in living things. So because we had 176 antibodies, the scale of the study lets us do it in mice, the smallest and simplest animal model. And so John Dye at USAMRID in his BSL-4 spacesuit um, looked at the ability of every single one of these antibodies to save the lives of experimental mice. And then we can rank order them. This one at the top, VIC-80, saved all the mice. Then we can rank order them all the way down. These save 40%, and there's a whole bunch that are running off the bottom of the screen that didn't work at all. Okay, now if we make an arbitrary line saying if they saved half the mice, they've got some benefit, and figure out where they bind, so we're gonna color code them by their binding site, slot them back into the grid, you get these results. So here's the code name of the antibody, and it saves 70% of the mice. VIC-130 saves 60%. So you can start to figure out where life-saving behavior occurs according to which spot it binds on the virus. So, for example, those against the base, like two-thirds of ZMAP, and the yellow KC-52 I showed you first, every single one of them works somewhat. Some work better than others. Whereas those against the mucin domain, there's a whole lot that don't work at all, and one that's okay. And so there's a range. But in every single one of these color-coded groups, there's something good. 
And so the first lesson we might learn is that you can get a good antibody against any site, but sometimes some sites are, are harder to find than others. Okay, but back to the question in the field. We wanted to know if neutralization correlated with protection. What that means is does a test tube assay tell you what's gonna work in protecting a living thing? And here's the answer. Sometimes it does. There are 92 antibodies in the study, of which we've got all the data for 131 so far, and I'm illuminating them here, and they don't work in test tubes, and they don't work in mice. And so if you had thrown them out based on their failure in test tubes, you would have done the right thing. Here are 16 of 131 that do both. They work in test tubes, and they work in mice. And here's the funny thing. Some of them are real good in test tubes. They have S. Some of them are pretty bad. They're weak. And here's a weak one that protects the same half of the mice as the strong ones. Okay, but if you go for, do they work at all in test tubes versus do they work at all in mice, you get those 16. Now here's the funny thing. Other times, test tubes don't correlate with living things. Here's 12 antibodies that do work in test tubes, but they don't save the lives of mice. And some of them are really strong neutralizers in test tubes. They work really well. So what that's telling us is the ability to inactivate the virus, probably by mechanically locking it together, is good, but it's not enough. You need something else. And that's kind of the same lesson we learned from ZMAP as well. Now here's the converse. Here's seven antibodies that protect mice, but they don't neutralize in cell culture. If you were looking at test tube assays alone, you never would have predicted these. And so the way they work has nothing to do with mechanically inactivating the virus. They have something to do with what works in a living thing, but not a test tube. They're probably recruiting different aspects of your immune system to destroy the infection. We call that immune effector functions. So we've got 16 that work in test tubes and mice. 12 that only work in test tubes, and seven that only work in mice. Now, 12 plus seven is 19. Now, here's the funny thing. Because this is the first study that's ever just cast a really broad agnostic net over the field to say, give us all your antibodies, we're gonna run them through everything and figure out what works. This is the first time we've ever seen studies like this. Usually, and what has always been done in the Ebola virus field since it was discovered in 1976, is that you try things in plastic test tubes, the ones that work, you put in mice. If they work in mice, you put them in guinea pigs. If they work in guinea pigs, you put them in monkeys. If they work in monkeys, maybe one day some lucky human will get a dose if they get infected. But we have just as many antibodies that don't make sense as that do. We have just as many antibodies for which that previous model of plastic and then bigger and bigger animals wasn't gonna work. And so we need to understand what information we're missing. Why are these 19 never been considered before? What information is in here? More importantly, how are these antibodies bringing to bear the different aspects of your immune system that would go and destroy infected cells so they could no longer be viral factories? Or using the recognition of an antibody to a foreign particle to signal events that mount other aspects of your immune system come in and control the infection. In viral infection, it's a tremendous back and forth battle. So we've seen this in HIV, which is really well studied. The virus is replicating, 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 and the immune system is destroying, 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 and it's a balance like this that goes on for decades. And if the patient ultimately doesn't do well, that balance starts to be tipped, where the virus can replicate faster than the immune system can destroy it. Drugs that work really well work by knocking that virus down to give their immune system a chance to keep it in check. And this is why people infected with HIV can now live an otherwise full life. And this is what we want to do for Ebola virus. We want to find molecules and antibodies that keep that virus down and destroy cells that have already been infected so they can't make more virus so that your immune system can clear it and go forward. Now here's the other thing the consortium is trying to do. So here's the map of Africa. And everywhere there's a spot is an Ebola virus outbreak. And the ones that kill people are called Sudan, Bundabujo, and Ebola. And they're all different viruses in all different places. They are different enough that antibodies against one don't work against the other. And all of these outbreaks here came from one single event, one single infected kid that ultimately spread it to 30,000 people. We see that potential now that any one of these viruses could make an outbreak of that size or even bigger that could move anywhere else. 
It could even move to densely populated cities in Central Africa or Asia or India or the United States. This year, this last year, what happened was that the virus somehow moved from that Central Africa and the red spots to West Africa. And there it found densely populated cities and mobile people. And that's how it ultimately spread to 30,000 people. But what if these other viruses, the blue one and the yellow one, spread? We didn't understand the ecological events that made the red one move to a new place and explode into 30,000 people I've never seen before. We need to have something ready and on deck for the blue virus or the yellow virus. So now that we have all the world's antibodies in one place, we can actually look and see, well, what's going to work beyond Ebola? What's going to work against the other viruses that have equivalent outbreak potential? So the ones I'm illuminating here are ones that bind all the different pathogenic viruses in this genus. And particularly, look at these three. They bind three different sites, so you could put them together in a cocktail. They work really well by themselves, and they are able to find their site in every very different species of the virus. So you could develop these three into a combination drug that could help you figure out how to defend against any new virus that might emerge. So the hair strategy gave us ZMAP. And ZMAP is only effective against one of those viruses, Ebola. But this tortoise strategy is now giving us this cocktail, which is broadly active. It'll inactivate or anchor to all the different viruses in that genus. They have equivalent outbreak potential. Now, the cool thing to note is that these three antibodies come from three different laboratories in two different continents. So this is a combination therapy that never would have been put together by any single laboratory working by themselves. It was only possible when all the scientists in the world got on the same page and decided we could try to do this from a larger scale study. And so I think that study works, which is pretty cool. Some of the people in the field really liked what we were doing, and they nominated us for an award, and we're now finalists. So we're finalists in the 2016 Classy Awards for Social Innovation, for pioneering a model by which scientists work together to accelerate research on a scale never seen before. And so that's pretty cool for a bunch of scientists that toil away in the labs in obscurity to be recognized for social innovations. We're pretty happy about that. So I want to thank the 40 different labs in the consortium, and especially the people in my own lab that make all this work possible, that saw those molecular structures that reveal where it might work. So Jessica, who you've heard from before, is going to become Dr. Bruin in about 10 days when she defends her research. <laughs> and the research she's doing, and the reason why she's going to get a PhD, and she's figured out what no one has ever figured out before, which is how these virus, different ways in which these viruses replicate. They have so few tools in their molecular toolkit, and she's figured out how they're able to come together and be oligomers and work in different ways, and she solves some different structures. So we're really proud of her, and we're delighted to be at Scripps, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, if an antibody works in a test tube, but not in animals, then why keep the antibody? Because you could turn it into something better. So an antibody is shaped like a Y, where the arms are what find Ebola virus, measles virus, smallpox virus, whatever you want, and they anchor on. And so it's that arm, the, the one that works against a specific pathogen, that does the job of neutralization. So either it anchors itself on to block the virus from attaching to the cell right, or by anchoring it on, it locks its machinery together. So those are good functions, but they're not enough. We know that we need the immune system. The legs of the Y are what brings the immune system in. And there's lots of different changes and modifications you can make to the, to the legs of that Y that will recruit the, all the 15 different functions an antibody might have in the immune system. So if you find a really good arm, you could design a better leg and make a better molecule. And I guess the other part of that question is that what this consortium is trying to do is what no one's ever done before, which is to <coughs> simultaneously do test tubes and animals. Before, everybody did everything in test tubes. And what worked in test tubes, they moved forward. And so no one's ever considered before what they were missing. And so we're trying to figure that out at the same time. OK, there's a question in the middle. When you showed the list of all those viruses, um, which one's the worst? You know, we really don't know which one's the worst. Um, we used to think that Ebola was 90% lethal, and Sudan was 50% lethal, and Bundabujo was 35% lethal, so therefore Ebola Zaire was the worst. 
But this year in West Africa, where it infected 30,000 people, it was about 40% lethal. So that makes it a better choice to have than Sudan, which is 50% lethal. And so we don't really know. And part of the problem is that it's based on really bad statistics. So most of the outbreaks have been small and in remote areas. And so in remote areas, there are two different things. The people may not have the same nutritional status as they do in the cities. They might also be more likely to be co-infected with some other virus or parasite that makes their immune system worse. And also, maybe we're not getting there to do the right counting. Maybe the only cases they knew about were the ones that were sick enough to require help in a pop-up treatment unit or the cases that actually died. Maybe there are an awful lot of people that were staying home with fever and headache and diarrhea that were deathly ill, but they got better. And if they weren't counted by the people on site, they wouldn't have gone into those statistics. So we don't really know. The other one in this genus, or in this family, a different genus, is Marburg virus. And when Marburg virus was first discovered, it was making European scientists and veterinarians incredibly sick. 20 to 40% died. And that was because they brought in animals for research that were infected with this new virus no one had ever seen before. But, and that was in the late 60s. But in 2004, 2005, Marburg ripped through a pediatric ward of a hospital, and it's 90% lethal in Angolan school children. And so there's two, dif two differences. You might say that European doctors get better care and are stronger to start with than an Angolan school child. It could also be that the virus that erupted in Angola in 2004 is different than the virus that they saw in 1966, 67, 68. And in fact, they've actually shown that, that the more modern strain is more lethal. And so it's really hard to make a good choice about which virus is actually worse because they're constantly changing. For the types of Ebola viruses that you showed, um, is the, the red one, what's it called? Zaire, Zaire Ebola virus. Is that the most common one? It is now. Um, you know, and I guess it was then too. We've seen more episodes of Ebola virus than Sudan virus or Bundabujo virus. Uh, and I think it's going to be a lot more common in the future because with 30,000 infected people producing, you know, up to eight liters of diarrhea a day going into untreated wastewater, it's going to return to the environment. How long does it take for one Ebola virus to reproduce? For one Ebola virus to be produced? Yeah. Um, hours? Yeah, you can track the infection cycle using uh, microscopy of infected cells, and it, it will enter cells in the course of minutes to an hour and start making copies of itself, and the new viruses bud out in, you know, within a day or two. It's pretty fast. These are incredibly fast. At time of death, a person could have a billion copies of the virus in a cubic centimeter of their blood. You use the word emerge and re-emerge for viruses. I, where does the virus emerge from? That's a really good question. Um, for viruses that we know the source, so these are called zoonotic infections. Zoo means animals, they come from animals. And so Marburg virus, we know a source that there's a particular kind of fruit bat that carries the virus. And when humans come in contact with that fruit bat, they tend to get infected, and that starts the outbreak among humans. And so, for example, these viruses could be hanging pretty densely in the top of a cave, and a tourist go into the cave, they get infected. Because, you know, at sunset, what bats all do is they fly out of the cave in mass and go seek bugs to eat. Well, as they take off and fly out, they urinate or defecate to lighten their weight. And if a whole bunch of tourists with cameras look up. <laughs> so uh, several Marburg virus outbreaks, or cases, particularly among American and Europeans, were tourists that went into these caves. Other outbreaks have started when um, bats populated a cotton factory where the workers got infected, or a mine, caves that were being mined, where people went in to mine minerals they wanted to get out. Ebola virus, we don't know its reservoir. It's thought to be a bat, but no one's ever found it. So 
And that's not for lack of trying. There are an awful lot of scientific groups that have spent months and months and months and months trapping all kinds of different animals and bugs and plants and anything in the area where a human outbreak happened and trying to look for evidence of Ebola virus in all of them. And that's been really hard to find. They've never found live virus in any bat in the area. And so part of it might be that Ebola virus doesn't really make the bats sick. They get infected and they replicate for a little while and then they just get better and they never knew that they were, I mean, they never got sick. And it seems to be the baby bats that are what we call immunologically naive. They get infected and they replicate the virus for a while and then they get over it. And the outbreaks, at least from Marburg virus, tend to be associated with a bat pupping season. So twice a year, there's new groups of baby bats in the cave. And that may be when there's a statistically enough amount of virus dropping around that people get infected. But they've never found that link yet for Ebola virus. Of course, when they heard that the patient zero, the two-year-old, had been playing on a hollowed out tree in which the villagers knew there to be a lot of bats, they rushed in, but the villagers had burned the tree down. And so it wasn't anything to look for. I mean, it makes sense to them. The source of this evil came from this tree. This tree must go. So um, yeah, it's really not known. And then how it got there, didn't know either. How exactly does Ebola like multiply? Do they like break apart and like keep breaking apart? It uses your cell as a production factory. So if the virus itself breaks apart, it's dead. It's not like a worm that breaks apart and becomes two worms. Um, what the virus does is it enters a cell it starts copying its genome, and it will produce thousands and thousands of new baby viruses that start budding out of that cell. And so it hijacks your own cell to become its replication machinery. And so when the new viruses come out of that cell, they're wrapped in a human membrane and covered in a human sugar. So that's part of its masking. How did the scientists overcome the viruses? And what did they realize when some people died? Uh, they, they haven't yet. It's the, the people's own immune system that have largely overcome it. In the treatment centers in Africa, often they were only really able to give them fluids at best, like an IV and a bottle of water at worst. And so this is, you know, this is a terrible thing. We need to, we absolutely have to have arsenals of drugs and vaccines and antibodies ready to help people for the next time. How those got discovered was in looking at different aspects of this virus's life cycle. How does it get into the cell? How does it copy itself once it's there? How do newly born viruses get back out? And trying to figure out what in there the virus needs so that that's what we should fight. Like it needs to, um, gather itself into a certain bundle in order to start replicating. Well, can we make a drug that'll interfere with its ability to bundle? Can we make a drug that'll interfere with its ability to attach to the cell? And so that's what we're trying to do.